going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It's Henry Zamoda and Danny Abdeljabar. What's up, pal? Chilling as per usual. How about yourself? I'm kind of pissed <laughs> off. Um, Why? Well, not really. I'm at, I'm in a good mood, and I'm actually I'm in a good mood. So okay, uh, gyms have opened up in New York City. The gyms again, are open. Finally. Gyms are opened. Mask it or casket, though. Got you know how I found out, though. How? Oh, as I soon as know. gyms were open, I was billed. Yeah. Oh, right, right. I was that, billed. That, that, that's that. how I. That's how I learned that gyms were mm-hmm. opening. That mm-hmm. I was through my credit card. Which gym? Which and gym are you a part of? New York Sports Club. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm, I'm a Planet Fatness member myself, but I got to cancel that because I got a gym in the building now. So. New York Sports Club is terrible, and they're they are notorious for their um, unethical. Um, dealings with clients and they just deliver horrible customer service. There are some gyms that haven't been renovated in decades, it seems like. And um, they play games with you where they will, you'll, you'll have a problem, they'll overcharge you. And then I've you'll been having a that. problem. <laughs> I've been having a problem. Um, and then they'll send you to someone else. They'll just jerk you around a lot. So I was billed at the elite gym uh the elite uh, gym member price but i've actually changed my gym to a non-elite gym and it's billed at the elite price but that happened gym's been shut down for about five months or so right and what are we five months away from march march april may june july august i guess technically it's september so we're heading into our sixth month <clears throat> yeah who would have thought um, but whatever, gyms are open. Everybody's so flabby. Finally, <laughs> finally, yeah, man, I look like shit. I'm ashamed, I, I'm ashamed to look at myself in the mirror. Yeah. Now, like I will take my shirt off. I won't look at myself at all in the shower. Going to the beach is like an absolute um, kind of horrifying experience for me. I'm just like, I haven't been able to lift. I, I, my my, pow- my powers are gone. Um, Excuse but, the dad bod. <laughs> Excuse, excuse the dad bod. Um, I feel like everyone's aged about five years in terms of like physique. Approximately. You see, you see yeah. guys who have uh, who have been in good shape, and you're like, oh, that's pretty you know, tough. Five some months. people are getting that coronavirus glow up. You know, some people are into the. I'm gonna put on a YouTube video of some kind of like hit class or like you know fucking yoga or some shit like that and they're actually being doing it consistently my girlfriend's one of them you know and some people are like taking this opportunity to work from home and all this other stuff and like in the middle of the day they're doing their little exercises at home and i'm I'm like wow props to you but you know (laughs) if there's no weights involved i'm I'm not interested (laughs) yeah i'm not i mean i see a lot of people working out in the park um being pretty um intuitive and well not intuitive not the right word they're being pretty um um smart the way that they're working out Mm -hmm. um resourceful um that's the word Mm -hmm. i'm looking for i just don't feel like doing like you know a thousand push-ups every single night and (laughs) that type of stuff like i want to lift weights and heavy weights i want to pick things up and put them down yeah but gyms are finally open (laughs) i don't know how these gyms are gonna work out as far as like capacity and like if the lines for squat racks are going to be like 15 minutes um or, or what but that is new territory um that i guess we'll we'll discover yeah but besides that how else are things well you know um they're going man i, I think you, you have an interesting situation because I, I just moved into a, a building with uh, that has a gym in the basement <clears throat> and uh you know they've been letting people in but you have to like go and like groups of 10 uh maximum you know so uh you know it's it's been interesting and everybody's wearing masks so that's something that you'll you'll find out that you have to wear a mask when you're in the building um so invest in one of those really like uh, thin neoprene ones just so you can get you know get the workout in without um you know looking like a total dick uh and so you can breathe but there have always been people at the gyms that i used to go to back in planet fatness where they're wearing like those fucking altitude masks so and that's because they're you know. super dumb and they yeah. go to planet fitness because those don't actually help you <laughs> no but uh yeah, they saw that in rocky <laughs> in the in the creed movie and they're like oh 
Well, Michael B. Jordan, Creed's son. Apollo Creed's son's doing it, so we should do it. Those yeah, things well. are ridiculous. And I see. I used to see people wearing them as well. They're almost as ridiculous as toe shoes. Hey, I have a pair of toe shoes. Don't hate on oh, toe shoes. Oh, God. <laughs> toe, toe shoes. They're, dude, they're great for, like, the beach, you know? Like, you ever you ever go into the, the water and it's, like, fucking stony as shit and it's got, like, mad, like, little critter crawlers on the floor and shit. And you just want to swim and you don't want to step on a fucking shell and, like, scream. So you wear them toe shoes. They're pretty cool. I'm sorry. I'm not a ditzy <laughs> uh, s- snowflake <laughs> Uh, urban urbanite i'm a city I can, boy i can hand my feet can handle the sand and the pebbles <laughs> i'm a city boy bro I got them um, soft all right feet. so let's um let's start talking about some uh interesting things and in, in the overall topic of today's show sure. so um, I guess on today's show, we're going to be talking about um, primar- primarily the Syrian civil war. We're going to be doing kind of a background thing, going over um, kind of like a complete history type type uh, thing. So we're going to be starting back from like the early years to the conflict. But before we get into that, um, there have been some current events that we need to follow up on. Um, number one being that... Well, first, let's touch on something we forgot to talk about last episode yeah, that yeah, yeah, we were totally. both planning on speaking about and mm-hmm. somehow it slipped our minds. Lukashenko. Lukashenko. So um, if you guys haven't tuned into our past couple episodes or if you haven't heard, um, there was a, an election in Belarus that was, I guess, deemed illegitimate or unfair. It was totally and illegitimate. And there were protests. <laughs> um, the, the dictator uh, Lukashenko has been a dictator since 1994. Um, and he was, he's still in power. And I think you were right. Um, as far as him holding on the power, mm-hmm. I think I, I said that I thought he was going to be out within the next couple of weeks and he's still in power. And I think he will be for the next, uh, for at least a bit foreseeable future. I mean, However, re- relevant, I think he's going to try and go the Assad route, you know, and just like stick to his guns quite literally, <laughs> uh, yeah. until he was walking around, uh, with, an, <laughs> with, a. With an AK forty seven, right? Yep, he was he was out there greeting the protesters with with literal like strapped. And dude was, probably doesn't was, even know how to use one of those things either. So like it, it was just like like total like power play or at least presumed power play. He didn't look cool, and uh, he just presented himself on the world stage as this you know pseudo strongman dictator type. You know that's that's what a dictator does. You know, that's what these strong men, if you won legitimately with 80% of the vote, right, which is bullshit, uh, then, you know, these protesters, wouldn't, these protests wouldn't be happening. And <clears throat> more to the point, you know, if you won legitimately, you're not out there fucking trying to, what is he going to do with the gun? Shoot people? You know, like, that's not a great look. Like, he's, he's, going, he's not going to accomplish anything. Going out like Scarface. Uh, let, me, let me tell you something, Okay. <laughs> I won with 80% of and the I vote. You know, the communists are always trying to tell you what to do. Um, <laughs> yeah, he looked like an insane person. It reminded me of when Roy Moore yeah. pulled out a gun mm-hmm. on stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In He's a like, campaign look at this. Like, <laughs> Nobody's look taking this ass. away from <laughs> me. <laughs> uh, hell yeah, I'm support second amendment. <laughs> that, that guy was a throwback to a time that I'm not sure ever even existed <laughs> or ever needed um, to exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that was a weird thing that I just, I, we had to touch on before we got into the main topic. Yeah. Second update is that Alexei Navalny, who we were talking about uh, pretty much for most of last episode was confirmed to be poisoned I by knew it. Germany. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, Alexei Navalny, uh, just quick synopsis, is a uh, anti-Putin guy. He was allegedly poisoned on a flight from Siberia to, to Moscow, and he was uh, put into a hospital. Russian doctors didn't find any poisoning. They then he find was requested poisoning. to go to a doctor in Germany, in Berlin, and then the doctors there found poison. Um, what have you heard about this? Yeah, so I've heard it's Novichok, which is the uh, same um, kind of like uh, nerve agent 
that was uh, used against Skripal back in what year was that? Was that 2016? I want to say it was 2016. I'm forgetting the dates. Um, but uh, Skripal was also like uh, you know one of those you know Russian dissidents. He was part of like the KGB or some shit like that too. I don't know. This, these people flip flop all the time. Anyway, he he fled to Britain, uh, became a British citizen, uh, and then um, was in around the year 2016 poisoned using Novichok. And Novichok is like a, a nerve agent that came out of the KGB's like um, chemical warfare unit, right? So it's like known that they created it. So German um, uh, medical people, uh, doctors. Uh, when they were uh, testing uh, and treating uh, Navalny here, they, they confirmed uh, um, uh, that Novichok had been used. Uh, and of course the Russian government is like denying it or whatever. Um, why would they use poison on some guy? Why would they do it now? Yada, yada. But I mean, like I, I, I kind of called it last time around. I'm like, he was definitely poisoned. All of the, all of the symptoms that the guy had, you know, lined up with it. And he was patently obvious when the russian doctors found quote unquote found no trace of poison that you know it was clearly just bullshit um but yeah i mean we're what's st what we still don't know is why uh because it is kind of like it's not a special time of the year or anything like that i, I do suppose alexei navalny was causing a little bit of trouble you know by flying around in siberia and, and supporting some opposition party people uh in that area but like it was nothing i don't know it wasn't it wasn't any any like great you know imminent danger to the russian federation you know like or to putin specifically so i'm not exactly sure why uh the russian government would have done it or if in fact the russian government themselves had done it um you know it's very possible it could have been you know one-off elements you know uh of the kgb uh or rather the fsb kgb doesn't exist anymore um yeah we don't know any of those answers, but you know the the big news is the fact that he is in fact he was in fact poisoned. Uh, well, unless Germany is lying, which I I I have seen and some people uh, say that they are, but I mean there's no evidence that they're lying. Um, you know you have to take some things at face value from time to time. Right. It's okay to question narratives, but if you don't take some things at face value, then like we have no basis for conversation or no basis to even communicate with each other. Correct. Um, so I, I mean, it certainly seems at this point he was poisoned, uh, right. unless there's like hardcore proof that, you know, other, it, it didn't happen. So, uh, I mean, who knows? Um, I, think, I agree I think with you, you if, Alexi, go with ahead. Alexi Navalny, not really being, I mean, we spoke about this last episode. So if you guys want more insight into this before we move on, um, I don't think Alexi Navalny is, is on the radar too much to, for Vladimir Putin. So I don't really think that he would go out of the way to um, poison him in some plot like this. It could be anyone, you know? Right. Um, yeah. I mean, that's if, my thing. If, if you're going to go down the, you know, question the mainstream narrative route, the question you should be asking isn't necessarily whether or not he was poisoned. I think that part is abundantly obvious. You know, I think you should be asking who poisoned him and why. Right. So if you want to start questioning, you know, mainstream narratives, that that would be the point to question. Who poisoned him and why? Mm -hmm. And I mean, it probably could be anyway, because that has been a common practice in that part of the world right. for a very long time. Um, all right. So do you want to talk about Syria and start getting on to the main topic? Yeah, totally. Should I um, should I start or um, I'll just lead you off and then you can just take it away. Okay, um, cool. So I guess to, to start this off. Um, we haven't talked about Syria in a while because there has been um, not really a ceasefire, but there hasn't been an offensive going an offensive going on as of late. Um, that being up in the northern part of the country, in the Idlib province, um, where the war is kind of the, the last front of the war, really. Um, there have been Russian reconnaissance planes flying over that area right mm -hmm. now. And from what I'm hearing and what I'm reading, I think there's – it looks like there's going to be an assault um, on Idlib again within the next – couple days, I uh, think, yeah. It could be a couple of days. It could be a couple of weeks. But relatively soon, it looks like there's going to be another assault. Mm -hmm. So 
I wanted to kind of sit down and, and just talk about the Syrian civil war and um, do kind of a complete breakdown. Um, but I guess first we're going to just fill you in on kind of current events and then we'll, but then we'll start going backwards. Yep. Um, all right, Danny, now you, you, you go talk. Cool. So like, I guess the, the relevant today's news before we talk about why, how we got here, um, would be obviously those, um, Russian fighter planes and, and reconnaissance planes doing missions over, over Idlib and specifically Southern Idlib, um, and kind of the reasons why, uh, that, that they started spinning up these sorties was, because southern Idlib is now unstable again. Although, can we ever really say that it was stable in the first place? Um, I think you know what you know was temporary, kind of stabilized after the end of the Syrian attack on the Turkish army, and that was uh, Operation Spring Shield uh, back in the spring. Um, and uh, the Turkish leadership um, basically had made extensive you know efforts to defend what you know their so-called moderate. Uh, rebels, but basically terrorists, Al Qaeda, uh, and and uh, the like. Um, you know, they've they've recently had to you know admit that uh, yeah, there's terrorists here, um, and so around and they've been using them in in, in Libya as well. Cor- correct. They've been bust- they've been sending them over to Libya to fight. They've been pushing so them over. Mm-hmm. The, the the Free Syrian Army is fighting in, in <laughs> Libya. Yeah, that that never made any sense to us. Um, but uh, so around March 5th uh, this year, 2020, uh, there was a, a de-escalation deal that was made between uh, Turkey and Russia pretty much right at you know the height of the tensions because Syria and uh, Turkey, it seemed like they were going about to hit war. Like they were exchanging blows and casualties and, and exchanging fire. It was, it was getting pretty nuts. Um, so they, they made a deal with Russia uh, who, who basically... Um, uh, uh, propagated the deal that said, okay, cool, we're going to create a demilitarized zone along that M4 highway. It stretches between two cities I can't pronounce, uh, <laughs> but uh, right around the southern um, Idlib province. Uh, and the deal basically mandated that heavy weapons uh, from both uh, militaries and radical militants and their formations be withdrawn from the zone. Um, so Ru- Russia and Turkey would jointly patrol that M4 highway and kind of police the, the terms of the deal. Uh, and basically the north would be run by Turkey and the south would be run by Russia. Uh, but, you know, at this point, you know, since March, as of September, most of this deal has just not been implemented like at all. At least the big high level ticket items haven't been um, so one uh, is that radicals and Al Qaeda are definitely still in that mil- in that demilitarized zone. Um, they're still definitely <laughs> doing shit, popping off. Um, there are there haven't been any any large movement uh, or or withdrawal of heavy machinery, heavy weaponry um, from either side, frankly. Uh, and the M4 highway, which uh, was we they were supposed to reopen it for the civilians has not been reopened for civilians so those three you know major points that were supposed to happen for that um de-escalation deal just just hasn't occurred one thing that has um uh, occurred is frequent firefights along the the highway you know between the turkish backed radicals and the syrian army um but uh, i guess kind of on the positive side of this all is that turkey um and syria uh, or turkey and russia rather have been doing joint drills um simulating you know attacks on those joint patrols uh but yeah i mean the major components of this deal have just not gone through um so right now i think you know this is prompting russia to start doing a lot of that reconnaissance probably passing along a lot of that information to their allies uh the syrian army um and i think the main issue here is that turkey is just not interested in stopping the radicals in idlib like at all I don't think they're shy about this either um, because it's just not it, it, like the, the radicals are the core of their influence in, in northwest Syria. You know, without them, Turkey's military by itself is not going to be able to, you know, hold that territory. Um, and, you know, Erdogan has this kind of neo Ottoman project going right now, uh, which involves expanding into new territory in, in uh, northern and northwest Syria. So, you know, kind of going against these, these moderates or confirmed terrorists at this point just aren't in their you know geopolitical interests right now so we're we're at pretty much the same spot we were at pre prior to march 
Yeah, and yeah, the the M4 and the M5 highway, like um, you know, the M4 highway is is basic. The M4 highway connects uh, Aleppo with Latakia, like the the um, the coastal line, and it runs along along the Turkey Turkish border, mm-hmm. but it intersects with the M5 highway, which which connects Aleppo to Damascus. Mm-hmm. So they're they're really important road systems, um, and they had been fighting for that. Um, for those for those roads in the beginning of the year it seems like everything was just like shut down to just due to coronavirus um i almost feel like that war was canceled because of coronavirus which and i'm not <laughs> even and, and i think that may be a legitimate reason yeah um everyone took a break um yes every, everyone just took a break i i've actually been seeing some uh some like military uh, uh like military on the ground and a lot of them are wearing like their face masks and stuff like that which is well, just a trip in and of itself it's like they're in an active war zone but they still had the foresight to think about putting on a mask what's interesting danny is that if you go back to our episodes back in february um we have episodes called like turkey and coronavirus or, or and, st- and stuff like that right. or syria and coronavirus because mm-hmm. coronavirus was like just just happening. starting to happen right um, I was still dismissing it as fake news at that time. <laughs> um, I was saying it was just like the bird flu or like other scares. And uh, you were like, no, it's real. And I was like, Phew. yeah, right. <laughs> it's going to be nothing but the bird flu nonsense. And, um, and then here we are. <laughs> uh, our lives are defined by it, mm-hmm. essentially. I don't know, but it's just, it's just such a crazy thing to – I mean like obviously – you know they want to make sure that their soldiers are in fighting condition and like an outbreak of the coronavirus within their ranks would be a fucking operational and logistical nightmare for them right they're in an active war zone that's the last thing they want but they're in an active war zone <laughs> you know it seems like they would you know they, they'd have greater concerns like getting shelled by an artillery or like catching a you know an ak-47 round to the chest but they all have the foresight to put on a mask you know what i mean it's it's just it's wild you know i mean um not to play down the virus but if you're in a war zone i think coronavirus is the least of your of your problems and yet they still uh, wear the masks yet they still... <laughs> hey if the army of conquest can wear a mask so you can you so can you yeah mask it or casket karen um <laughs> so I, I wanted to um, to do kind of a recap, but not like a recap in, in uh, the normal sense. I, I wanted to go back in time and, um, and and talk about the origins of the Syrian civil war mm-hmm. um, from like its inception. Right. Well, so, so not I, I don't want to throw around, the thing about this topic is that it's almost impossible to uh, to take a lot of things at face value because there's so much propaganda on both sides that that kind of uh, dominate the news. So you really have to read about it and find the right the right sources uh, between you know our me- media in the West and also um, the RT Russian version. Uh, they're both misleading and inaccurate sure. in a lot of ways. Yep. So. I feel like it makes more sense to, to go back and, and start talking about, you know, what are the leading factors of what led to the Syrian civil war. And, um, so I feel like there's a bunch of different places that you can start, but like, where do you think we should start? Um, you know, ex- to, to explain like why, why we're in a civil war and side note, if you can explain why you call it a civil war, missed missed one of our viewers is asking. So perhaps, perhaps that can be a part of it. I call this a civil war just so people know what I'm talking about. Um, that, that, that's why. If I say Syrian war, they're going to think it's something completely different. Um, but I understand where you're getting at, that it's more of an invasion than an actual civil war. But, I mean, I don't think that's entirely true. I, there definitely was. I, I, I'm not one of these people who completely dismisses that there weren't serious problems in that government prior to the war like there was an opposition it just wasn't the opposition that took up arms and started fighting was were were funded and uh we'll they were get funded we'll by get let's outside give... <laughs> countries but let's let's yeah. start out so i think you're i think you're forced to start with world war one mm. so prior to the war that region of the world was part of the ottoman empire and 
when the Ottomans entered the war on the side of the Germans, they declared a holy war against the Allied powers, meaning they were encouraging Muslims in that country and in countries like Serbia and in Montenegro and and more importantly, British and French colonies to rise up and rebel. So the British made alliances with the Sharif of Mecca, promising them an Arab state. Mm if they launched an Arab revolt against the Ottomans. The problem is, is that they were secretly negotiating with the French to really just split up the Ottoman Empire like a Thanksgiving Day turkey. Um, this was the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which Picot. was the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which was, you know, ISIS has used this as a, as a, as a right. grievance right. for their caliphate. Strangely enough, rightly so, too. You know, if there's like choosing my words really carefully here, it, they bring up good points about how Sykes Pico really fucked the whole Middle East. Well, yeah, um, it, they obviously they're they're valid criticisms. Um, now someone is going to uh, capture that and say Danny Abeljabar says ISIS brings up good points. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> fair point. Um, I think they make fair points about like women driving. I'm joking. No. I don't think that. <laughs> no. um, so no, I mean, I, they, they, they obviously use that as their starting point, but then yeah. you know, their their I mean, ending point is fucking that, ridiculous. Right? Like, you know, like women should drive. You. No. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm talking about Sykes Pico, not women driving. <laughs> so. They, they basically drew a line, a diagonal line through the Ottoman provinces outside of the Arabian Peninsula. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the way it was set up is that the British would take what is today southern Israel, uh, Palestine, Jordan, Transjordan, southern at the time. Iraq, mm -hmm. yeah, Transjordan, what it was called at the time. And the French would take parts of Turkey, the southern parts northern iraq syria and lebanon and it's like the reasons why they one of these sides were just for it i mean they were kind of just drawing lines through resources um french was france was france was concerned about like the location of syria because it's like right in a um kind of like a, almost like a highway system that leads to asia and europe and turkey mm -hmm. They also kind of had a, you know, they thought they had a claim over it because there were like ancient, cruc they were older crusade castles and things like that. So they were like, yeah, we have claim to this because there's like French, because there's years of uh, French, French architecture here and, and French architecture and French schools here. So, you know, if we lay claim to this and then the British were concerned about oil interest, but I mean, that really came later. They were more concerned about just there's the Suez Canal. That's why they wanted that buffer zone on, on the, on the southern part of that agreement. But um, yeah, it, it was kind of just a crudely drawn line that was that was uh, dr drawn across the Middle East. And the British didn't even want to really give France anything, but they were just placating them because of past imperial disputes that took place in Africa about 20 years prior to that. Um, so they, you know, were kind of just cutting them some slack because they didn't want to piss off their partner in the war who was taking the majority of casualties on the Western front. So, um, this is, this, this is the time of Lawrence of Arabia and Lawrence, T.E. Lawrence knew very well that they were, the British government was going to backstab the Arabs. Like they, I mean, he, he knew what was going on. He, he was actively participating in lying to them. I think he was a sympathizer to the Arab cause, but he definitely knew, I think his nationalism outweighed his sympathies to the Arabs. Mm -hmm. um, to throw another wrench loop in there is that the Russians were involved in the deal as well, but they went communist. So they had to pull themselves out. So it ended up screwing things up, but they were going to get Constantinople and Turkey. But, um, they had a you snooze just, you lose i guess you snooze you lose um but also uh, the british in 1917 make a public statement that they're supporting a national homeland for 
for Jewish people in Palestine through the Belfair Declaration. So they just essentially the British are just over promising. They're, they're promising the same pieces of land mm -hmm. for different people, and they yeah. just can't deliver on that for everyone. Right. Excuse me. So um, at the end of World War One, the Arab insurgency that is um, kind of fostered by you know British intelligence. They capture Damascus and they set up a government and they elect a Heshemite king. Heshemite king. A fucking Heshemite king. The solution to every single problem. In the Middle East, what, at least. In the Middle East. That's what they thought. That's what they, um, that's what, that's what the neoconservatives thought that you could do to Iraq after Saddam Hussein was gone. Just, just throw a fucking Heshemite king Heshemite on that. King, yeah. Throw mm -hmm. fucking Heshemite king there. They'll be fine. They'll shut up. They'll just throw it. Because the last Heshemite king on the throne didn't work out so well. The last king of Iraq we was should, We should do an episode on Heshemite kings. Or just, like, where do Heshemites come from? I'd like to I'd like to learn more about that. Well, I'll tell you a little bit. I mean, they, were, they are uh, allegedly the direct lineage of Muhammad. Mm. So they come allegedly. from... They were like the, the wardens of, of Mecca, or I don't know if I'm saying that right, but they are the, you know, the, the, they are in the Muhammad lineage chart, and they were the stewards of that area prior Didn't to... Didn't the Muhammad Islam. lineage chart split, though, and that's why we have Sunni and, um, and Shiite? Yeah, but that happened back in the 7th century. Hmm. So this is, this is post-split. This is different. The vast majority of Muslims are Sunni. Um, but the Middle East is the only place that really, well, I guess we're talking about the same thing right here, but the Middle East is the only place that has like divisions, um, like a large, uh, actual, uh, minority of Shiites, but that's a whole different story. Um, so the Syrian Arab kingdom lasts about four months before <laughs> they were ultimately invaded and then occupied by the French. And King Faisal ends up fleeing to Palestine in British territory. He is actually given the job as king of Iraq. See, that I don't get that. Like, you know, I don't understand monarchy's appeal in, in general, but like why or how more likely do you take someone who was appointed as king of Syria and then just make him king? in iraq doesn't doesn't like a kingdom necessitate like reverence to the king by their subjects like there's this random you know guy from that was once the king of syria is now our king like i don't know how does that work out well in the case of king faisal he had a good relationship with with british intelligence and then he also had uh was you know he fought in the arab revolt so I guess they thought that he would be a good guy to put on the throne, and, and he was well—he was a well-spoken guy, and they thought that he could handle the job. Um, the only reason why he was deposed is because the French came in to get their, you know, to get their part of the deal to collect on but, that side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it wasn't a matter of him, you know, being deposed by the people. Who knows if that would have happened? Maybe it probably could have it happened to his. Um, I forget if it's his grandson or if it's mm -hmm. his nephew, but well, wasn't his the, family like assassinated though? Yeah, well, the, there's the the break off in Jordan. There, Hashemites, um, the family in Iraq was assassinated, mm -hmm. but there's still Hashemites around. But uh, the one that the big regicide was in was in Iraq. That's the, that's the one. I forget if it's his grandson or or nephew or whatever i forget the exact relationship there but the the point is is that um he was given that that as a job to kind of run that area um so when the french occupied the ottoman territories their policy was to divide and rule so their aim was to facilitate ethnic and religious tensions and they did this by creating separate regions of four Christians, Alawites, Druze, um, usually, well, favoring the Christian minority there. And this all leads to a really big uprising in, in 1925. Um, and it's kind of like the beginning of Arab nationalism, like what turns into pan-Arabism and 
what turns into uh, like you know kind of the philosophy behind a bath party. Um, it's one of those kind of uh, origin stories or origin moments. Um, the, the French respond to this rebellion by, I mean, a by playing different religious sects against each other. And also by bombing, by aerial uh, bombarding, bombing cities. And, all, like and also bombing. <laughs> and also bombing cities <laughs> like Damascus. I mean, the British were doing the same thing in right, Iraq. Right, right, At that time. Um, there's a famous quote by um, Prime Minister David, Lord jo- David Lloyd George that says that he has the right to, to bomb. I'm not going to say the rest of that sentence because it will get me kicked off. A not pleasant word. I reserve the right to bomb racist word. So I think it's important, though, to take note when it comes to talking about, um, you know, Arab nationalism. There's a, there's an ideology that's also growing um, outside of, that's mainly growing in Egypt, which is pan Islamism, which which with groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, which advocate not a Arab unity, but under An unity Islamic with Islam. Mm-hmm. So there's a political Islam uh, taking place in that side of the world. Right. So at some juncture, though, the French have to leave, though, right? So they leave after World War Two. When, when Germany occupied France in 1939, they created the Vichy government to, to administer and govern all their former colonies. And this actually opens up a theater of, um, it, it opens up a, a theater of war in World War II that's pretty much not talked about. It's hidden in history. The, the British invasion of French Syria and Lebanon, where um, the British actually expel the Vichy government. This is what um, Casablanca is based off of. Mm-hmm. They are, it's like the free French versus the, the Vichy French. But um, yeah, they, they, when the war ends, France doesn't really have the ability to hold on to these imperial possessions. So they're, they leave Syria in 1946. And when Syria first becomes an independent state, they immediately face a major crisis, which is the formation of Israel. They were one of the founding members of the Arab League, which called for the expulsion of, of Zionism from Palestine. So mm-hmm. when they went to war, ultimately, you know, they, they lose that war. But this battle, I guess, with Zionism and, and Western imperialism it gives this rise to intense Arab nationalism. And right. in the late 1940s and 1950s, um, this is when you see the emergence of the Syrian Ba'athist party. Uh, Ba'ath means rebirth. They were leftist, secular, nationalist, um, who were founded by Marxists who were educated in Paris. And they combined Marxism with pan-Arabism calling for a single socialist Arab nation. The goal was to unify with other Arab states. And they did. In 1958, Egypt and Syria formed one country, the United Arab Republic. And um, it doesn't really work out because the Ba'athists, I guess they thought that they were going to be the ones who are in power, but there ended up being a bigger, badder fish. I mean, a kind of more, um, I don't know the exact reasons why they split up from what I've read. It's because Nasser wasn't really the president of Egypt at that time. Wasn't, um, didn't really want to share power with, with the Ba'athist part of the Syrian government. Hmm. So they ended up unifying. Um, but the union lasts about two years before Syria ultimately withdraws. And, after they withdraw, and this is prior to the war, uh, prior to their unity as well, um, they go through a period of absolute, complete instability where there's just coup after coup. And the 24-year pe- period between independence and Assad's father, there were seven military coups. Whoa, seven? 
There were military I coups. I didn't know there were seven. There were seven military coups between 1946 and 1970. And Hafez al-Assad, the, the father of the leader now, he was a a uh, military officer who did a coup on the government. A successful one at that. A successful one. Well, he was an Air Force general. Mm-hmm. And he had been a leader during the um, 67 war. Um, he had become the, the minister of defense. So he overthrew the government in 1970. And um, he had, he held on to power for the remaining, for, for 30 years until he died. Um, Hafez al-Assad you know, ruled that country. Mm-hmm. And he was a tyrant, but... I guess the violence was a lot lower. So I guess when a tyrant comes, brings, brings some stability, um, I guess it's more people just kind of deal with it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But Assad's family, what made it kind of unique is that Assad's family was an Alawite, a Muslim sect that is kind of a break off from Shia Muslim. And they were kind of poor mountain people. Who suffered under a lot of discri- discrimination under previous regimes, and um, under Assad, Alawites started getting top government positions. Before, so before Syria in a civil war in 2011, about 74 percent of Syrians were Sunni. Um, I think about 10 percent were Christian, 16 percent were Alawite and Druze. Um, and then there's also the Kurds who are up in the north right. who consider themselves Syrians, but they're not Arabs. Uh, Very diverse for have, Middle Eastern standards, yeah. Yeah, who did not have citizenship in Syria prior to that. Um, what I, what Assad did and in, in how he played minority groups against each other is that he made a coalition with the minority groups to control the state. So Sunnis were at the, at the shit end of, of that. Um, so essentially what he did is that he kind of made the, the government, the protectorates of, um, everyone who's not a Sunni because the vast majority of Syria is a Sunni, is a Sunni state primarily. Mm -hmm. Um, and you kind of have like the reverse situation in Iran, uh, in in Iraq, excuse me, where you have a minority leader, uh, but it's on the other end of a, a Sunni secular leader rather than a. Alawi secular leader right ruling the majority so the Muslim Brotherhood um, they kind of they take advantage of this resentment so in 1979 and I'm sure you've heard this story before in 1979 um, there was a Islamist extremist attack at a artillery school killing a group of cadets and the government turned around and they and they blamed the Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood. Mm-hmm. Now I don't know, I don't know if it's like if there was any proof that they did this or not, but they uh, they were nevertheless blamed yeah, for this. They certainly got the blame for it. Yeah. And there, there were there were two factions of the Muslim Brotherhood. There's like an old, there's a younger one and an older one, and the older one just kind of bounced and they left the country. The younger the younger faction was left to make the decisions. Um, the older faction is more so like the, you know, the ones who want to talk things out and make peace. Um, the younger ones are, uh, you know, for w- whatever reasons, are more willing to, uh, you know, take violent actions. And they made they were the ones left to make the decisions within the group. And the decisions that they made were just really bad. <laughs> so they tried to assassinate Hafaz el-Assad with a grenade. With a hand grenade. With a hand grenade. <laughs> And they, I mean, it didn't, they didn't succeed. Um, he actually kicked the grenade away. Well, there was a couple of, it's a kind of a crazy story. They lob a bunch of grenades at him uh-huh. and they fire machine gun fire at him. His, he kicks one grenade away and then his bodyguard jumps on the other one. Hmm. So I, I can imagine, you know, after narrowly escaping with his He's life. got some Ronald Reagan in him. Seriously. After after narrowly escaping with his life, like what what did Hafez al Assad do in response? I can imagine he'd want to crack down. So he had 
he had uh, the Brotherhood members who were currently incarcerated. They had he had them all executed. Jeez. So he killed more than six hundred Muslim Brotherhood members in jail. It gets worse though, right? <laughs> yeah. So I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. In, in eighty, so in nineteen eighty two, there was an uprising that broke out in the city of Hama, and the the MB was a straight up just killing. Baptist officials mm -hmm. and Assad responded by really just slaughtering them. He sent 12,000 troops to Hama. He gave people a few hours to leave and then he just shelled the city. Jesus Christ. So he killed about 10,000 people. Or at least that's the estimate. Who knows what these estimates, but it was a bloodbath. He killed, he massacred them. And a lot of them, I'd imagine, had nothing to do with the Muslim Brotherhood. Most of them had probably nothing to do with them. But I guess the mentality is is that, I mean, if you didn't leave, then you're probably one of them, right? I mean, I guess, but like, it's kind of hard to just up and leave in a couple of hours, you know? Yeah. And while while the impending you know the doom of your home and your livelihood and everything like that, like, you know, can you imagine like somebody says like, hey. New York City, everyone get the fuck out in two hours because we're about to shell the shit out of it. There's going to be a number of people that are going to stick around. Whether or not they're a part of it is irrelevant. You know, They're going to stand their ground, so to speak, or just hope that they can avoid the worst of it. You know, like there's, there's more than a few reasons why people would stay and not, not have anything to do with, um, you know, the bad people. Well, there's, it's, there is um, not a case of there's not a moral case you can make for doing that no that that government really hated no. mm -hmm. islamists yeah like they hate they hated them and they would say this to the west they'd be like hey man we just did you a favor we just wiped out a bunch of islamists right so they were definitely guilty um and his hafaz i think was was a debt was a lot more I don't want to say more cunning, but I think he was more of a Vladimir Putin type than his son, mm. than Bashar. He was like a 40 he, chess he player. Came from, he came from the military. He had all these alliances and systems set up with, you know, he would, uh, you know, he was allied with the Soviet Union, but then he flipped sides went after the Iraq war, uh, the first Iraq war, um, to to join the US it's you know he kind of flipped sides a lot and was always kind of moving and shaking um, when he dies so they were grooming Bashar's brother right to be to be the president but he died in a car accident yeah, it wasn't wasn't like um, wasn't he doing a ophthalmology or whatever like an eye doctor Bashar yeah <laughs> but he had no idea <laughs> he was working as an ophthalmologist in London yeah and he was forced to come back and be in service president when his father died. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Like, you're just working as an eye doctor in London. You got your own little practice. Like, yeah, obviously your dad's a dictator in another country. But, like, for all intents and purposes, you're just, you know, you're just doing your thing. <laughs> and then suddenly they call you in to be a dictator. Like, that's got to be a crazy transition. It's like the Godfather. Seriously, yeah. Kind of Sonny gets killed. Yeah. Michael has to come, but Michael was supposed to be a senator, or Senator Corleone, Governor Corleone, President. Um, I never wanted this life for you, Michael. Uh, but yeah, but he's kind of like I mean, that's the way that you could look at it. He's he's like the Michael. He's like Michael from The Godfather, mm -hmm. where he was brought in. Yeah. Uh, when he had a, when he was obviously very brilliant and smart in other ways, um, didn't really need to pursue the life in government that his brother was destined to. So, when he comes, when he takes power, though, this is two thousand. They had to change the constitution to let him run, because there was an age requirement to be thirty-five. I think he was. 30 oh shit he was that young he was young he was a young man when this was like our, almost our age huh. yeah he was i forget the exact age but they had to change the age requirement 
so to they, let him I mean, run, quote unquote, right? Let him, like, to let him run. I mean, he won with like ninety-seven percent of the yeah, vote, so it wasn't like really Lukashenko running. like margins there, you know? Like, I mean, it's greater than Lukashenko <laughs> margins. There's yeah. single party, no party opposition. It's single just, digit, <laughs> it's single single digit. Um, no, just yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I, but people thought that he was going to be a reformer. Because you know he had he was a doctor, he spoke fluent English, he was educated. Mm-hmm. Um, his he had a wife. Well, he has a wife who, who uh, I guess you know she, she she seems you know like a lovely woman. Mm-hmm. So he had all the uh, kind of the aesthetics to appear well, and I mean by all means he seemed like he probably did have some. Uh, reform in mind when he took power well, I mean, that's what he I said when you take power too you know he when was, he said he could he could have it's really impossible to know what his intentions were before i kind of look at him as a complicated person who was who was thrown into this entire this this government business um almost against his will right. to not really be able to um kind of change the screwed up systems within the government right and some big shoes uh, to fill in time too, until, had... until everything really just imploded. Right. But I guess one of the huge problems with with Syria was the cronyism that that went on. Mm-hmm. So something that Assad did do, knew it, but Bashar al Assad is that he did he did liberalize it, and AKA liberalize a country that had, because we're talking about a country that had state owned industries. Mm -hmm. These Middle Eastern countries, they were leftist type governments where they had, you know, there, there wasn't like, there was private property, but not much. So you had state run industries and when they were, they kind of had the same situation that we were talking about with Russia right. last week, right. where there was olig- or oligarchs that were coming in and, and buying mm-hmm. up all the assets. But and it makes sense it was because actually, like what, what you said before, you know, the the kind of starting of Syria was, you know, the combined Marxism and Pan Arabism, you know, from like educated Paris, right? So like it, it makes sense that that's how the government would have been set up at this time, because that's, that's how it started. So they, the the people who bought up the state ran the, the former state run industries were were like Assad's cousins, were family members. Mm. Uncle so Bashar's nephews, right? His his cousin, well, his cousin. Um, so Rami Makhlouf, and I I pulled this out of a book called Inside Syria from Rhys Ehrlich, which is an interesting book. Is reported R- Rami Makhlouf probably pronouncing his name Mac wrong. Makhlouf. An Assad cousin is reportedly the richest man in Syria, worth an estimated $5 billion. He owns a variety of businesses, including tourist hotels, duty-free shops, and luxury department stores. He became infamous for his role as owner of cell phone giant Siratel. 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 The company grew to control 55% of the Syrian market. In the early months of 2011, uprising regime opponents accused Makhlouf of financing pro-Assad demonstrations. They later learned that Siratel was cooperating with the regime to tap activist phones. Demonstrators burned Siratel posters and stopped, stopped on SIM cards in protest. That's interesting. Smart move. You know, you control the, the communications towers and, and, you know, the 55% of the Syrian market, yeah, you can totally get a lot of uh, opposition research, let's call it, out of it. But it's just, when companies have that much market share, it's almost always by government help, by some type of government yeah, intervention, like, government welfare. Yeah, so it's sure. just the system itself is just, it's it's not real capitalism, it's crony capitalism. When there's that much market sell market share mm-hmm. concentration in the hands of just you know one conglomerate one um, family really there's no yeah. competition that's that's coming up to to stop it's i mean that's no third party competition like outside of the country coming in and and doing that either like yeah you're right they're they're blocking they're blocking it so cronyism 
And I'm saying this is because I'm, I'm bringing this up because I, in no way, I'm, I'm completely aware of the bad things that that government has done and, and does. Um, torture was another big problem. Mm. So I'm pulling this from Reese Ehrlich again, who is a really great, well, he's a great uh, war reporter. Assad routinely used torture and arbitrary arrest to suppress any opposition. Ironically, incontrovertible proof In came incontrovertible. to light. Incontrovertible proof <laughs> came to light because of a rare example of Amer American Syrian cooperation. In 2002, the Bush administration requested that Syrian authorities integrate Mahir Arar, a Canadian citizen, citizen of Syrian origin. The U.S. government had detained Arar at JFK Airport in 2002 on suspicion of terrorism and forcibly deported him to Damascus. It became one of the most infamous cases of extraordinary rendition in which U.S. authorities kidnapped, kidnapped suspected terrorists and sent them to secret jails for torture. Assad's security services brutally tortured Arar for a year, for a year before determining he was innocent. An official Canadian government commission investigated the case and exon exonerated Arar, and the Canadian government awarded him $12.5 million. Neither the U.S. nor Syrian governments apologized or paid compensation. Several members of the House of Representatives did apologize unofficially. Hmm. So I guess you ever hear what they used to say about Syria as far as torture? So if you wanted to get information... I forget what, I think it was Iraq. You would send them over to Jordan if you were interrogating them. Mm -hmm. You would send them to Jordan. If you wanted to get, if you just wanted to torture them, you send them, you'd to, send Syria. them to Syria. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted them to disappear, you would send them to Egypt. Mm. That's the so old, that's, that's the old. Works. Yeah. So, I mean, they used to, we used to send people there to get tortured. It's like the hidden so, Guantanamo. So the one that people don't know about. So there was a, it was a nice little partnership going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then within those years, people like to bring up the droughts a lot when it comes to what the happened. Hashtag global it, warming. Or just like, yeah. Um, usually it's our, our liberals. <laughs> um, but I don't think the drought had that much to do with it, to yeah. be completely honest. It exacerbated things, you know. It's, yeah, it could have exacerbated things, but I think that was kind of used as a political uh, kind of talking point yeah. for people on the left. Yeah. But yeah, there was no doubt that it affected uh, like agriculture, the agriculture sector within the country, yep. and the rural areas. And the rural areas are the ones that really did rebel. Right. You know, it's kind of funny. You know, when we there's so much talk about civil war right now. You know it. Go on like any type of uh, partisan YouTube channel, and it's like the civil war is among us. We are so close to a civil second war. Second civil war in America. Second civil war. How do we get back together? When people get to the reason why there's not going to be a civil war, there's going to be people like fighting and stuff on the street, probably and riots and crazy stuff like that. But there's not going to be a full scale civil war because most people are going to find the. Um, are not going to want to participate in the things that that uh, require a civil war to take place, as in getting shot and killed, right? Or Having living outside cities, in a box hole, leveled, leveling a city, right? Um, getting lice, you know, you know, just, just all the nasty things. Losing that access to the internet. Let's just stop. Losing, like just yeah, that just alone. Minor. Yeah. That that would be enough for people to flip their shit and be like, no, I'm going home. Enough of this shit. People lose internet for five minutes and they have a panic attack. Right. In these virus times, it's one thing that unites us all. Fucking Spectrum. <laughs> yeah. Why is my Netflix still buffering? <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. People have people have. Um, tipper tantrums over just minor first world problems. Yeah, I was watching videos for you know today of just just the carnage uh, that we're about to talk about, and 
really puts things into perspective when we think about you know and i'm talking about left and right here when people say oh you know it's this country isn't headed in the wrong direction it's like a you know it's terrible it's a shithole where a tinder pot's like none of this shit is like even scratching the surface for how bad it was out there in syria and how bad it still is largely in a lot of places um we've got it great you know it was really humbling to 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 watch this and it's crazy just to think about that that it's been going on for this we're in our 10th year now you know we're in the 10th year we're, we're in the 10th year mm-hmm. um so the official story of of how the war starts and um this is kind of like the narrative that you know we were all taught taught from bbc is that some teenagers were detained and they were tortured for writing anti-regime graffiti on some walls and there were demonstrations against the government that broke out in the southern city of Dara, and then later in Damascus. And Assad tried, you know, he gave some political concessions, um, like releasing prisoners and stuff, and um, lifting that state of emergency uh, that I spoke about earlier. And then he also granted citizenships to citizenship to Kurds. Um, but those weren't enough, and like the brutal regime was just so bad that they started shooting protesters and all well, this stuff. They did, and, and all hell. <laughs> they totally and did. I mean, a lot of that is true. <laughs> a lot of that is true. They did do violence on protesters. Yeah, they did open fire uh, on protesters. That that was caught on camera. They, so yeah, but I mean, that's like what's left out is that the protesters. There were protesters, but. It's kind of like the situation that you have right now in the mm-hmm. U.S., where you do have legitimate protesters who are are going out and you know protesting for BLM or uh, you know whatever cause. Um, BLM is the most recent example, but then you also have you know raging lunatics within some of these crowds sure. that throw Molotov cocktails mm-hmm. and shoot bottle rockets and uh, will just be there to uh, cause as much chaos as possible. Right. Imagine that times 50. Right. And like a mass protest. And, you know, the official story with the Arab Spring is that, you know, a guy is beat up by cop. You know, it's actually sprung up by police violence. Right. You know, is, 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 very is it very similar to here? Right. Here? Except, except, our, except our police and our government and our military, for that matter, has the restraint not to open fire on protesters, regardless of how you know um, how violent they can get, and and even here they have been pretty violent, but um, it was different there. They have different culture, well, different not gonna, set, not system of government. Like in Syria, they were just like, "Cool, shoot them, open fire, suppress the the uprising, suppress the the demonstrations." Well, what's interesting is that the in Tunisia when um, the guy lit himself on fire. Mm-hmm. He that was in response to a bunch of cops um, roughing him up because he didn't have the right permits right. to sell fruit. Right, right. They were bullying so, him essentially. They were basically just. Um, they were not only bullying him; they were, they were extorting him. Right. I mean, that's what the cops are do in these countries. Right. Like, in are you think police are bad <laughs> in the U.S. Yeah. And just go to. A third world countries, the police are fucking awful. Right. <laughs> they're fucking crip. Like, mm-hmm. they're just great. Straight up, like, bossing people around, extorting people left and right. They're thugs. Right. I completely get how you end up. What's the saying? Like, power, the corru- power corrupts absolutely, right? So, like, yeah. you, you hand, uh, you know, some local folks, you know, guns and give them the authority to police others and, and uh, you know, enforce the rules. And they're going to take that as an uh, as an opportunity to enrich themselves and to you know uh, make their lives better. So um, yeah. So and I say this because I I 100% believe that there was you know there there are people who are like well, there was actually no opposition in Syria. All of it was ex- imported into the country. Mm-hmm. There was no. I mean mm-hmm. that's that's just that's not unlikely. that's just crazy. That's like, very that's unlikely. Not, <laughs> that's unlikely that there was no opposition. You can say that the the countries that we're going to talk about 
played to that. They're like, okay, there's civil unrest. Now's our opportunity to to start some real problems. Right. But to say that there is not actual opposition or there was not a, a really long list of grievances about the government that had been in power for at that point forty years it's just naive, yeah, is just um, it it's. It's almost anti-American. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I'll say, I think there are people who tend to agree a lot with some of the things that we say, who almost come at it at a point of like everything that the U.S. or everything the U.S. does is bad. Right. Like they just hate America. Mm -hmm. I don't come at it from that point. I just come at it from like they lie about a lot of stuff. But – um no, I think there were leg legitimate grievances. However, um, the powers that be definitely played on all that to make it as violent as a rebellion as humanly possible. Right. And they did this by fostering and abetting um, what became as moderate rebels, moderate rebels to overthrow the government because they were the more pow powerful faction. And... The groups that splintered off like the FSA from the Syrian military, they were, if not Salafist, uh, Islamist, they were at the very least collaborating with them and um, at the very least growing out their beards so they would look more jihadi so they would get more funding. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like they would seriously grow beards so they would look the part even if they maybe weren't hardcore Islamist. Because they knew that that was the more attractive a rebel to arm. So you mean the U.S. government pays you to grow a beard? I had been doing that for months before, and I didn't get any money. <laughs> you just get a check. <laughs> well, I did get that stimulus check, so maybe that. <laughs> Go pro... oh, yeah, that's a. Yeah, that's just grow grow they beard. They're not giving you checks; they're giving you cash. Cash. And Toyota trucks. <laughs> it's <a> true story. <laughs> Toyota trucks. So, like, what? Are, so, the reasons why? So, what are the reasons why the U.S. would want to overthrow, or just the coalition of the West would want to overthrow? War for this oil. War for oil. Right. No, I don't think it's. <laughs> well, I think some. A, a very, very little bit. Very little. So, oil is not a huge export. Well, it is, I guess, relatively within the Syrian economy that it is a, a big mineral. But right. in world terms, against like world or uh, against Saudi Arabia or, or Russia or the United States or Iran, or, yeah, it's not not even close. They they export very little oil. They most of their oils in the, in their northern. Kurdish region of the country, but they don't really right. they don't really export. That's not like their economy. They have a surprisingly diverse economy where they have an agriculture uh, sector. They have um, they have like uh, they have kind of like a, they, they have, have some diverse. manufacturing for sure. That's yeah. in the south, right? And then that, not everything is oil, mm -hmm. right? They have tourism uh, had tourism but where oil comes in. Where oil comes in is that so Syria's location comes into play with well let's let's talk about like just their location in general so it has no minerals it produces relatively little oil it doesn't really have important seaports or military bases with the exception of the russian base over in tardis right so they are important because they border Turkey, Iraq, Lebanon, Israel, and Jordan. <laughs> right. Because they're and the middle they, ground between all of them. They they border at pretty much all the countries in the Middle East. They're right in the middle. They're like a highway. Right. A land they're bridge. Kind of like a land bridge, if you will. A land bridge. And Iran flies arms into Damascus, which are transported over land to Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. Lebanon. Right. Mm -hmm. So whoever holds power in Syria has significant impact in terms of Israeli policy mm -hmm. and then as well as Iranian politics. as well as Iranian for sure Pipe, pipeline politics mm. so of course. it comes into play in terms of just general geopolitics I hate using that word now and it's part of the podcast and I don't know how to get rid of shed it 
Let's come up with a new words. Geopolitics. We're cool. We're talking about geopolitics. <laughs> um, but um, could Qatar wanted to construct a pipeline from its gas fields and through Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Syria, and then ultimately to Turkey, and it would have they would have competed with Russian gas exports. For, for Europe, for the European market specifically. For the European market, because mm-hmm. Russia dominates the market. So right. there's going to be one that went through the Arabian Peninsula up into Europe. Mm-hmm. Assad said no. Stupid. And they said yes to another deal. That was with Iran for a different pipeline. Right. That was a dumb move. In hindsight, it probably was. I mean, the Europeans weren't going to buy... Or you know, are sanctioned against buying Iranian petroleum and, and oil products. Why don't you just take the deal with Qatar? They already made money. Stupid. Well, they couldn't abandon their ally, Iran. That's one. And then you make then, two pipelines, and then you mix well, up the well, oil by together. Doing that, by doing that, they created a lot of enemies. Um, I mean, not just from the U.S. It. They. Would. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good way to say it. It would be a threat to Turkey because the oil transported out now through the BTC pipeline, with the one that goes through the Caspian Sea to to uh, from Azerbaijan to Georgia to Turkey. Right. Um, that would be in direct competition to that pipeline. So, I guess Turkey's interest is that you can't build a pipeline if the country is at war. That is true. It is kind of hard to build a pipeline when you're at war. And I think the I think the biggest reason, and I think it's the easiest Ox, o, like uh, Occam's razor reason, is that it's because they're allied with Iran. Yeah, and nobody likes them. <laughs> they're they're allied with Iran. Yeah, and I guess there was the redirection, as Scott Horton says. It's the and this is a a Seymour Hirsch uh, article uh, called the redirection where the Bush administration after invading Iraq and handing Iraq to the to the Shiites basically they created they made Iraq into a um, a Iranian satellite state the Saudi princes were like what the fuck like look what you just did you just you were supposed to put the next mustache in charge, not some, not an Iranian, like not an Iranian proxy, essentially. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that Dick Cheney had to go and publicly apologize um, to to uh, King Fod. He was like, he's like, yeah, sorry, we really fucked this one up. Uh, we thought that we were gonna get like another Hashtag strong King. man, uh, yeah. and uh, we ended up blowing up in our faces. So they had to. Uh, placate the saudis and, and i guess this goes this applies to i guess the war in yemen as well um but they had to redirect their efforts against the the shiite militias in the in the iranian in the, the iranian groups in syria um so i think that's a big part of it as well they had to to kind of change course and be more aggressive towards Iran um, because they screwed up so much in Iraq. Because the war itself, I don't want to get too much into the war because we'll just go down to too many larger holes right, right mm-hmm. now. But the war itself is ridiculous uh, in terms of like when to support uh, rebels and when not to support rebels. Uh, like Which essentially rebels a matter to support? Of what, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's essentially it's a matter of what country they're in and at what time right. because – one Shiite militia will be an ally to U.S. troops in Iraq and an when they're enemy fighting in ISIS. Syria. Yeah. And then when they're in Syria, they're the enemy. So it's just right. ridiculous. And some, some but, allies, like, like as an example, the Kurds, right? That's like a whole kind of different side story that was going on there. Kurdish people being the, you know, fourth largest, uh, you know, diaspora of people, you know, in ethnic diaspora in the Middle East. But that don't have a singular country of their own. They they live in Syria and you know Turkey and Iran and Iraq. You know, um, and uh, you know kind of their whole uh, um, their whole um, role in this. You know, is completely separate or at least largely separate from you know the initial Arab Spring component. And then 
we didn't even touch on ISIS. Like that doesn't <laughs> that warrants its own show in and of itself, you know. Um, springing up out of nowhere that kind of derails the whole focus from this initial kind of you know uh, Arab Spring idea and external countries, you know, uh, ginning up the 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 violence there, uh, and yeah, the whole thing was just like quagmire on top of quagmire on top of quagmire and. It's been going on for way too fucking long. And it's about to go on to more. Mm-hmm. But I don't, I am, I don't know about you, but I am bliss in blistering heat right now. It <laughs> feels like it's about 100 degrees inside this room because I have to, I have to AC and fans are all off. So I don't know if I can go any much longer um, unless you have some other stuff to say. No, man, I think that was pretty good. Hopefully now you've, you've come away with, you know, a better understanding of like how did this nonsense start yeah and i don't i know we missed we didn't tackle a lot of things that are definitely important to the story but it's impossible to touch everything in like an hour and a half and i feel like other people do a good job and we've had a lot of podcasts in the past that go over the stuff in more detail Mm -hmm. um another podcast that you can listen from us that i recommend is if you want um definitely like the pro syria narrative go listen to my interview with uh richard black it's uh it's incredibly interesting and it will definitely uh open some windows in your brain about the war um but i would i would encourage you guys to listen to it's probably the most interesting interview that we've done on this show interesting (laughs) yes it was i i mean i love talking to senator richard black all right guys um i'm going to, we're going to end this up um if you guys are watching on youtube subscribe to the youtube channel or like the video or whatever hit the bell icon and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we're going live so you get notified when we're going live um and then guys who are listening on the apple podcast or spotify or whatever we go we do this on youtube uh, every Every Thursday. Thursday night between nine and ten, we'll we'll do it. Uh, so feel free to join, and you can even chat at us. And sometimes, if we see it, we'll respond to your question. And um, yeah, make sure you you rate and review the podcast, which is the number one way to help us grow. Um, I am ha- sorry that I am talking slow right now, but I feel like I am in the middle of the desert, <laughs> or an, I feel like I'm in an armpit right now. That's the humidity <laughs> level. My skin is essentially like a frog. Who just, You're amphibious at this point. I'm, I'm amphibious at this point. I'm sweating my ass off. Thank God I don't have a 4K camera because I would look like a <laughs> mess. Yeah, we got to get you one eventually and some good lighting. <laughs> well, my, uh, my lamp isn't good enough? Your lamp. I've had this lamp for years. And now it's my main podcast light. You don't like my picture, my wall of, uh, see, I'm all about having a functional studio rather than a good looking studio. That, uh, that foam right here makes the sound quality of a $30 microphone sound pretty legitimate. It makes it sound like a $35 microphone. <laughs> it makes it sound like a $35 microphone. And it only cost you $60. It only cost me $60. What, the microphone? <laughs> no, the foam. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the foam? Yeah, the foam only... Co- the, the foam was more money than the microphone. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, peace, guys. Peace.